All right, so week two and moving on to our calculations. So hopefully you remember from our first week, uh, what we did is we used this experimental setup. We gathered some uh, experimental data that was on masses of things that we had. So massive empty, empty test tube plus massive potassium chlorate. The difference of those is going to tell us, again, the mass of potassium chlorate we used. Do your experiment, liberate some gas, right? We're going to use the pressure, volume, and temperature of the gas that's liberated. Okay, we need to know those. And then you're going to mass that test tube at the end, and the difference between your empty test tube and then the test tube at the end is going to tell you the mass of the product that you made. So now we're ready to go and think about what is the product that we sort of make. So reminding you again here, looked at it a different way than we looked at it in the beginning, here's the general equation for what, what's going on. We're taking potassium chlorate, we're heating it, right? And that is going to liberate oxygen. It's going to leave behind potassium uh, 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 with a chloride and, and maybe some oxygen, depending on how much is liberated, right? So if we lose all of the oxygen, the salt that we're left with is potassium chloride. And look at this. This is what the stoichiometry is going to be. It's going to be 2 to 2 to 3. This is going to become a really important piece here. If we lose most of the oxygen, not all of the oxygen, but most of it, and we're going to generate potassium hypochlorite, then we're going to have a 1 to 1 to 1 stoichiometry there right? And if we lose some of the oxygen, then we're going to take our potassium chlorate and we're going to generate potassium chlorite, okay? And now that's a 2 to 2 to 1. So take a look at this. This is a 2 to 2 to, uh, sorry, 2 to 2 to 3, 2 to 2 to 3, 1 to 1 to 1, 2 to 2 to 1. All different stoichiometric ratios that are, that are here depending on which chemical reaction that we do. So part of what we're going to do here, remember we said there's gravimetric analysis and then there's volumetric analysis. When we do volumetric analysis, we're going to be looking at the volume of oxygen gas that we liberate. And then we're going to say, let's do a theoretical yield calculation based on the starting number of grams of potassium chlorate that we have what is the number of moles of oxygen that we could produce under each of these situations? And then we're going to do a PV equals NRT calculation to say, well, what is the actual amount of moles of oxygen gas that we liberated? Compare those two, and they should be consistent with one of these reactions. Okay. Then we're going to do our gravimetric analysis. That's looking at the mass of a product that we made, not a volume of a product, volume of a product, mass of a product. And now we're going to do the same thing, different stoichiometric relationship. Now it's going to be between the mass of our starting potassium chlorate and then, again, the mass of the potassium salt that we make. Three possibilities that we have there. We're going to determine under each three of those sort of situations, what's the mass of the potassium salt that we'd make? And then that's just a direct comparison because we actually, in our experimental data, measured the mass of the salt that we made. See which one is most consistent with your experimental data and see if that can inform you with what the overall reaction that happened. Did potassium chlorate lose most of its oxygen, or I'm sorry, all of its oxygen, most of its oxygen, or just some of its oxygen. So I'm going to walk you through the calculations here in this next part of the video. And then at the end, I'm going to ask you to think about how um, you might have had some error that occurred that might have affected your calculations. And again, when we talk about error, we're not usually saying, I did a calculation wrong. Uh, we're asking, did something happen um, in my experiment? And how do I predict that that would affect my results? That's really what we want to think about in terms of sort of uh, our experimental work. All right, so first let's take our volumetric analysis. And remember, that's relating the mass of the potassium chlorate that we started with with the volume of oxygen that we liberate. Okay, so again, we have a known mass of potassium chlorate that we started out with. That's some experimental data, right? We can use molecular weight to determine the number of moles that we'd have of potassium chlorate. Other things that we measured is we've got a volume, temperature, and pressure of the oxygen gas that's liberated. Remember, the volume of oxygen gas really was a proxy for the volume of water that was pushed out of our system. Temperature is obviously something we just measure with a thermometer, and we have to do a little bit of calculating to say, you know what? The pressure that we see from the barometer and the weatherman is really the total pressure. Our total pressure is really a sum of the partial pressure of oxygen plus the partial pressure of water since we collected our gas over water. So if I want to figure out the contribution to that total pressure just from oxygen, I have to subtract off the contribution 
from water and that again is temperature dependent so I have to know the temperature look that up on a chart and I'll be able to determine what that is all right so here's how these calculations work Again, we can determine what's the theoretical maximum number of moles of oxygen that I should make. Taking again the moles of potassium chlorate that I had, using each of these balanced chemical equations, the moles of oxygen produced compared to the moles of uh, potassium chlorate used, those are going to be different depending on which potassium salt I made. Okay, so I'm going to have three calculations that I do here, and then I'm going to have a predicted number of moles of oxygen that I'd make. Okay, so three calculations that you have here because there's three possible options. Next piece is saying, okay, well, how many actual moles of oxygen did I make? And that's what we're going to use PV equals NRT. So solving PV equals NRT for N, that's what we're interested in, the moles of oxygen. Okay, again, I know the pressure of oxygen. We talked about how we determine that. The volume we get as a proxy for the volume of water that was displaced. And the temperature we just measure with the thermometer. Put that together with the uh, uh, gas constant there and we have the actual moles of oxygen okay now we're going to compare that to the predicted moles of oxygen and then we're going to say which reaction happened depending on which of these is most consistent with our experimental data okay so that's our volumetric analysis now let's talk about our gravimetric analysis. And hopefully you sort of see what we're doing here. In our gravimetric analysis, we're doing a stoichiometric analysis between these two pieces, okay? Again, we're gonna have a known mass and thus known number of moles of potassium chlorate that we started out with. This is going to be a predicted mass of product that we're going to make. Now we actually measure the mass of the product that we had, so that's going to be a pretty straightforward comparison. But here's how that initial calculation is going to work. Again, for each possible equation, knowing that that stoichiometry is different, we're going to take the moles of potassium chlorate that we have, use our balanced chemical equation, three options, so three calculations, and then using the molecular weight for each of the possible potassium salts, I'm going to get a predicted mass of the potassium salt that could be made, again, under each of these situations. This one is actually pretty simple to do that comparison because there's no calculation even to do for the actual mass of the product that we did. We just, that's a number that we measured. That was an experimental piece of data. Again, comparing what we have here is going to show us that hopefully one of the experimental um, reactions, one of these reactions here is going to be most consistent with our gravimetric data. Hopefully we have data that's consistent from the volumetric analysis as well as the gravimetric analysis, but it's possible that might not be the case. So here's where we need to think about error analysis, right? When we think about error analysis, I want you to be able to think, think about, you know, uh, experimental, I don't want to say mistakes, but experimental observations or things that happened that you figure were not probably supposed to happen. What we're going to do in this little table here is we're going to say, what would the effect on the moles of oxygen generated be, right? That's going to affect our volumetric analysis piece. And then we're going to say, well, would that have an effect on the mass of the product that we produced, right? That's going to have a, an effect on our gravimetric analysis piece. So I've got three that I want you to think about here. We're going to take them through one at a time, but these are sort of the common mistakes that often can happen when doing an experiment like this. Well, the first one is maybe your experimental setup didn't operate just right and maybe you, you had a hole in your tubing or maybe you um, lost some water uh, in this process. Either way, losing water is equivalent to losing gas and maybe you had both happen. But when you lose water, that ultimately is a loss of gas or maybe you actually lost gas directly. Lots of things can contribute to this piece, but let's see how the effect is on both of these. Now, again, if we're having our system sort of operating and the chemistry is happening, but we're losing some of that oxygen or the water, so we're not measuring or capturing as much oxygen, again, that's going to be reflected here. Remember, this was the calculation that we did. So if we decrease the volume that we're either measuring directly or maybe we actually lost some oxygen, okay? That ultimately is gonna result in a lower number of moles of oxygen. Now, see if this makes sense. There really should be no effect on the massive product that we made because we're still converting that potassium chlorate into its product uh, uh, solid, but we're just losing some of the other pieces that we have there. 
So that's how we think. That's a very common thing to happen is that water spills out. Uh, we don't exactly have um, uh, our system fully closed. So maybe some of the gas leaks out. Lots of things can potentially happen. Okay. Another common thing to think about and think about what would, what would it mean for sort of this specific situation is maybe we have an incomplete reaction. Let's remember what this reaction was, okay? And again, we could say that this is CLOX, but let's just imagine here that if this happens to less than 100%, we're going to have some of the potassium chlorate left over, okay? We're not going to be generating as much oxygen as we should, okay? So this is going to be decreased. Okay, but in theory, the mass of the product is going to appear to be larger. And I know this is a little bit hard to think about because people think, well, wait a minute, if this didn't go at 100%, I have less potassium, uh, my potassium salt. But remember, the reason you have less of your potassium salt is because some of this is sticking around. Okay, that's a heavier product. No matter what it, uh, um, what we end up with at the end, we've lost some, most, or all of our oxygen. So if this is still sticking around, it's added in with the potassium uh, salt that we make as a product. So we're going to have a higher um, mass product than we should. So you can see that both of these would result in lower sort of um, experimentally observed moles of water. This guy would have no effect on the mass of the product. This one would increase it. So again, thinking about what might be happening with your experimental data. Okay. The last piece is maybe something was wrong with sort of pressure. And I'm going to put one other piece in here too. Maybe we misread the pressure or if we were using the pressure from the weatherman, maybe that really wasn't the pressure in the third floor of Zurn at Mercyhurst University. Um, maybe we misread the temperature, right? But what I want you to think about here is how each of these might affect. So as an example, let's say that we had a lower temperature, right? Maybe that was not the same as, as, as what the water was, or maybe we had a higher temperature. Just taking both of these in, if we had a higher uh, pressure and a lower temperature, okay, both of those are going to result in an increase in the number of moles of oxygen. We would not necessarily predict that these two measured parameters would have any effect on the mass of the product that we have, right? But again, this is really one of the only ways that we can justify a higher moles of oxygen. So see what your data tells you. When you have your data and you do your calculations, we'll walk through what the correct answer is. And then whether you are right or wrong or high or low, you are going to want to justify your answers. Okay. So hopefully this error analysis piece can help you to think through that. All right, and that's our lab on the decomposition of potassium chlorate.